Hello, friends, and welcome to episode number six of Nostalgia Talk. Uh, first of all, sorry that the last few videos weren't Nostalgia Talk related, but I hope you like my friend's band. Uh, yeah, that was a pretty fun night, uh, watching them perform live, so Travis, if you are watching this, you guys are awesome. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's get right into, uh, Nostalgia Talk. I am here with Patrick Bristow. Hello, Patrick. Hi, how are you, James? I am very well, and you? Good, good. No nice. complaints. Awesome. Now, if you're my age, you've probably seen Patrick Bristow on many sitcoms from Disney Channel and Nickelodeon, such as... Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Belle and the Bulldogs, Good Luck Charlie, Crash and Bernstein, Raven, Thundermans, a, yep. uh, Friends, which is not from Disney Channel or Nickelodeon, uh, yep. Ellen, Mad About You, basically, this guy has been on every sitcom, pretty much, in existence, so this is quite an honor. I think, I think there's a few that I haven't been on, I'm pretty sure there's, a, there's at least two or three. Aw, yeah, they, they, they missed out on a real big opportunity there. <laughs> I, I tried to tell them that, but they didn't listen. Rats. <laughs> Rats. Yeah, well, a lot of the shows that you were on for Disney Channel and Nickelodeon, uh, believe it or not, I'm 21 years old, and I was watching a lot of these shows, even in my teenage years, and they inspired me to want to get into filmmaking, and now I'm in my last year at film school. Oh, wow, congratulations. Thank you. That's fantastic. So now are you doing film school remotely because of the pandemic? Pretty much, yeah. Everything's over. Uh, we use Microsoft Teams, so I do. So I do all of my. Um, I, I do my schoolwork from here, and I attend classes over Microsoft Teams. So we get our assignments uh, over Teams, and then they put them online. Uh, it's fun, but it's a bit of a challenge. Right, right. I would imagine it is. Mm. Yeah. So let's you get. Know, the what you said about you know still watching some of those shows in your teens. I think one of the reasons uh, a lot of those shows. Uh, had broader audiences than just their target demographics, just the kid kids, was because they had writers on these shows that had really written during the kind of like the golden age of sitcoms in the uh, 70s and 80s and knew their way around a story and a script and could write stuff that would appeal to, you know, a, a broader audience than just the kids who it was, you know, targeted at. Right, yeah. I, well, I was a teenager when I was watching these shows and, um, Bell and the Bulldogs, especially, that's the, that's the big one for me. That was the one that really inspired me to want to get into filmmaking. Um, I, think it, I, I think it was the episode, I don't think you were in it, but it was, uh, have you seen that show apart from the episodes you were in? No, no, I haven't. Aw. I don't think I even saw one of the episodes that I did. Aw. Well, they're, they're funny. <laughs> it's a long story. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I do. I do have some questions about uh, Bella and the Bulldogs, but the episode that really inspired me to want to get into filmmaking was Bella was. I think. I think it was that her team uh, wasn't going to get into the playoffs. She was anxious about that. Her hand was shaking, and I was going into grade eleven. So that meant I was two years away from graduating. I'm watching that episode. And I'm like, that's me. That is exactly what I'm going through right now. Ah, uh, yeah. You know, when characters are going through the same things we are, and there's something relatable. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it can be, I, I don't want to sound spooky, spooky or like, you know, metaphysical or anything, but, um, healing might not be the wrong word, but it's reaffirming, you know, right. even just a story. Um, you, you realize that if it is a story, then there must be a lot of people also dealing with the same thing. So mm, very well said. Now I'm going to stop rambling and get right into uh, the interview. Uh, so I read online that your parents were performers. Is that what got you interested in acting? You know, I think so. Um, my parents met in the theater in Los Angeles. Uh, they were both stage actors, and my mom was also a ballet dancer. Um, and uh, they, this was after World War II, so it's like oh, the wow. late 1940s that they were really pursuing their careers. And then um, kind of uh, gave them up and decided to you know, have family and, and all that kind of stuff around 1950. So um, I was surrounded by all the photos of the plays that they had done and heard their stories. And so I think that got me, um, just, just put it on radar that this is something you can do. Nice. And you started with the Groundlings Improv Troupe, I, I had heard. Absolutely. So after um, after college and you know doing some local plays and things like that, um, uh, a friend of mine told me about a class they took at the Groundlings for improv, and 
and I thought that sounded great, so I went and took a class there, and it was like being bitten by the bug. I was just, you know, I was hooked, um, and loved improv, and loved the teachers there, and the friends I made, um, you know, I really blessed the day in 1986 that I first walked through the doors of that school. Nice. But everything in my uh, life, professional and a lot of personal, um, that is great, has come from that decision that day to go to that place. Even my, my husband, uh, I met him in there. He was uh, working uh, as a staff. But uh, Aww. Yeah. That's very sweet. Also, a little thing to the viewers out there. Uh, I don't know if anyone heard... Uh, that phone ringing in the back, uh, that was my house phone. I do apologize for that. Uh, I... I think I'm going to leave. <laughs> That's too much. I didn't hear it, but now that you cop to it, I'm going to just be really judgmental and be a diva. So. <laughs> Sorry about that, Patrick. <laughs> it's going to take more than an apology. I mean, like a fruit basket, or you're going to have to send me like a really great gift certificate to some... <laughs> I don't know, some place that's, you know, fancy. And then I'll think about it, okay? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> okay, moving on from that, um, what do you think you learned from uh, acting with the Groundlings? You know, I think compared to my traditional acting um, training, what the Groundlings taught me was that I can pretty much survive anything because... When you're doing improv or when you're putting up, you know, a, a bunch of sketches in live shows every week and trying them out and you're barely memorized when you hit the stage or maybe you're not memorized <laughs> uh, and, and things go sideways sometimes, you know, you start building a certain type of confidence that, you know, I may fall off the horse, I may fall hard, but I can get back up on it and it's just a momentary, you know, um, a momentary blip. So by not being afraid to make mistakes and having that kind of, not a cocky confidence, but a confidence that, you know, I'll get through it. If, if things don't go well, I will get through it. It allows you to take more chances, and when you take more chances, that's often when the really good stuff happens, when the great discoveries occur, when you learn how to maybe do a type of character that you didn't think you could do, you know? So yeah. um, I like that kind of thrill ride aspect of it. So I think the Groundlings gave me that. Nice. Nice. So did you work with, when you were in the Groundlings, did you work with anyone very famous? Because I know that Lisa Kudrow from Friends was in the Groundlings. Was she there oh, when was, you were? Yeah, yeah. Lisa and I were in the main company at the same time. And, uh, you know, we did a, a fair amount of sketches together and enjoyed improvising together. Um, as you probably know, she's very, very smart and always has been. Um, and has a very dry sense of humor, um, and I just I just loved her characters. And then of course I was also in with uh, Kathy Griffin. Um, nice. Yeah. And then there were people that were before my time, like Pee Wee Herman, and Elvira, um, John Lovitz, Phil Hartman. Um, I was in with Julia Sweeney. And then right after I uh, left my, I, I retired from the Groundlings and gave up my space in the company. Um, a, a really talented crop came through with uh, Will Ferrell and Sherry O'Terry and Chris Kattan and Maya Rudolph and Anna Gosteyer and, you know, uh, Kristen Wiig and just tons of uh, Melissa McCarthy. Um, so there was just this incredibly rich um, generation of very talented performers that came right after me. That's really cool. Wow. Yes. Yeah, and, and, it, and it's funny because the last guest I had on here was uh, Pat Fraley. Uh, do you know who that is? Yeah. Okay. He was talking about his friendship with Ed Asner. Um, have you ever seen the movie Elf? You know what? I haven't. Oh, uh, boo! <laughs> yeah, boo on me. Yeah, Will Ferrell and Ed Asner starred in that together, and Pat was telling me a little story that Ed learned a lot about acting from Will Ferrell. Wow, that is probably the highest praise, isn't it? Yeah, well, I'm a big fan of that film, and especially with the holidays coming uh, coming around, uh, my my dad, my sister, and I just recently watched that. It's so funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I imagine it is. I know it's really popular, and I know people say it's great, so guess what? It's on my list for this season. Awesome, let me know what you think. <laughs> I definitely will. Nice. So after you did The Groundlings, um, 
you went into uh, acting like in front of a camera. Do you remember the very first ever appearance uh, on TV or film that you had as an actor? Yeah, and actually it was while I was still a Groundling student. Oh, wow. Uh, one of the teachers there was a writer-producer on a show called Webster, and it was a sitcom with Emmanuel Lewis, and they had a part for a bellhop, and I was, you know, the skinny, red-haired, you know, bubble-eyed, you know, kind of kid-looking 20-something-year-old, and so uh, I auditioned for that and got it, and that was my first, uh, yeah, my first, you know, SAG on-camera job. Sweet. Nice. Yeah. Do, you, do you ever use what you learned uh, in improv for when you make appearances in TV and movies? Oh, absolutely, especially during the preparation part, you know, when I'm, when I'm playing with it, when I'm either getting ready to audition or even once I've booked it and they send me, you know, the final script. Um, and using some of the improv muscles, like, uh, you know, imagination um, nice. and kind of a what-if uh approach to, you know, rehearsing it and, and, and finding different, uh, you know, ways to approach the scene in terms of the character's emotions and moods and goals. Um, and sometimes, you know, uh, running the scene by myself and not using the lines that are written, but using the lines that I, you know, think could be an alternate version of it. Now, of course, when I actually do the audition or, or the, the job, I will do the lines as written, you know. But, um, but sometimes that kind of like improv or semi-improv approach helps just make the, the character and the circumstances um, more real, more dimensional to me. And right. improv, um, as we know it, of course, is a performance um, you know, uh, discipline. It you know, isn't how it started. I mean, uh, it, it's got a rich history for everything back to the medieval uh, passion plays and the commedia troops that um, had outlines for their plays, that they would do the same play, but a little bit different every town they went to, every time they did it. And that was just the approach. Then it was kind of revived as a rehearsal um, technique for theater, um, in which uh, you know actors could play a scene that is not in the play, but maybe happened earlier that day, and improvise it in the characters. And then nice. that would help inform the way that they actually played the scene on the page in the play um so you know uh it's also it's also used in a therapeutic um environment um by viola spolin so um it it has a lot of applications and it comes from a, a variety of different historical um events cool i'm doing improv courses right now with uh, neptune theater here in uh, nova scotia canada and uh, that's that's fun. I haven't really done. I, I I I like to write a lot more than I like to perform, but I have been kind of getting a little bit better with improv, which is kind of nice. Cool. Well, you know, it's like anything. The more you do it, the better you'll get. And I think you might find that you can translate that to your writing. Um, one of the things that the Groundlings uh, we did a fair amount of was if we had the assignment to write a sketch. Um, sometimes we would uh, improvise at first, or even if we were co-writing it and I was at a friend's apartment, we mess around and improv and then write down what we came up with. Nice. Then we go back and go, you know what, structurally we should probably play that beat out a little bit longer, and then we'd improvise that, or, you know, or just write it more traditionally. But improv was a part of generating material, generating ideas, and then also flushing out existing ideas. So you, you might see that the improv helps you uh, in the writing as well, I think. I, I think you might be right on that. I'll take you up on that one. So, I think the role that you've done the most in any TV uh, appearance is probably Peter Barnes on Ellen. Yeah, back in the 90s, right? Yes. Um, do you have any funny stories from behind the scenes of that show that you'd like to share? You know, I don't know if I have particularly funny um Oh, but, but, but this isn't funny. It might be amusing. Okay, I'm just Let's not going to overspell it. But in my very first episode, I played, you know, as it introduced the character Peter, and he was supposed to be a one-time guest star, but Ellen and the producers kind of took to the character, and so they brought me back, which was a huge blessing. But one of the things I had to do, and I'm always, I'm not great with props all the time. I get klutzy. I don't know what it is. Um, but I had to use one of those tape 
you know, guns that they use in shipping departments where you tape a cardboard box. Oh, wow. Right? And then you, you cut it right with a flick with the wrist. There's like a little serrated blade on it that cuts the tape. And people that are good at it just do it all the time. They hit the side of the box, they tape it closed, they flick their wrist, and it cuts the tape, and they're done. Wow. And I was supposed to do that, like, really efficiently. And I practiced with the prop when I wasn't, you know, rehearsing the scene. And I pretty much had it down kind of. I had a pretty decent batting average. And I wasn't very good at it. And the joke was that I was supposed to be excellent at it, hand it to Ellen, and then she was going to be a mess. Oh, wow. And, and what, you know, which, and of course she'd make a comic gem out of the physical comedy of it. And what ended up happening when we taped it <laughs> was I couldn't quite get it. And I don't remember which version they finally used um, for the episode, but I know there were several takes of that where I was messing up and then finally, you know, handed it to her and then she did it perfectly. Oh, wow. So it flipped because I really couldn't do it well and she could do it like that. I think they ended up using, um, they ended up editing it in a way that it preserved their first joke. But um, there was that moment where it was like, I'm sure they were going, he can't really do this. Should we change the joke? You know, and um, luckily she could. So oh, wow. that was, I, I think I probably was blushing during that and, you know, breaking out in a flop sweat because <laughs> of anxiety and nerves. Uh, I've, I've been there before many, many times, I feel ya. Right there, right there with you. Yeah. Um, another popular role that you have, this is more of a one-time role, but it's, uh, it was on a very popular TV show, one I mentioned in the intro. You are a stage manager on an episode of Friends. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the one with the routine, I think, is the name of the uh, episode. It's, it's so crazy. Every episode starts with the one with something or other, which, which kind of makes it yeah. so confusing for fans, because it's like you can picture fans talking, oh, which episode was that on? Oh, it was the one with the something or other. Well, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, I think, I think the diehard fans know exactly what it is. Um, I guess they wanted to have fun with naming the episodes, you know, you can't always come up with, not that they couldn't have, they could, but a lot of shows try to come up with clever titles and plays on words and all that kind of stuff, and I think they just thought it was maybe more modern just to cut to the chase and go, ah, oh, the one with the phone booth, whatever, you know. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so when you did that episode of, uh, of Friends, if you have any funny stories from, I'm going to mention quite a few characters from TV shows that you did. If you, have, if you have any funny stories from those particular episodes, feel free to share if you want. Um, uh, but when you did Friends, because Lisa Kudrow is on that show, as I had mentioned before, and you knew her from the Groundlings. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you know, um, when, I, when I did that episode of Friends, it was great going in knowing that I was going to see Lisa you know, and um, I was just disappointed she and I didn't get to act together. Rats. Uh, all, all my scenes were, you know, in that, that dance show, the New Year's Eve um, segment. And, um, you know, nothing really particularly funny happened, although during a rehearsal, I had a clipboard because I was supposed to be like a stage manager. Right. And I gestured with it, and it hit Courtney Cox's hand. Oh, jeez. Yeah, ah! I went, oh my god, oh my god, are you okay? She goes, uh, yeah, I think so. She's like kind of like checking, you know, because it it really wrapped her knuckles. And, Dang. Um, and so after that rehearsal, I went to the prop department. I said, is there a way I can get a non-metal, less lethal clipboard? <laughs> like one of those ones made out of composite, cardboard, wood, you know, kind of thing with rounded edges. Because um, I was so afraid if I did it again, you know, I, I didn't want to hurt her and, you know. Um, it's their show, and they've got a lot of pressure on them. The last thing they need is a guest star who's possibly going to injure them. So I did get the better, um, the better, uh, what do you call it, um, clipboard. But the next day when we rehearsed, and I had the clipboard, I showed it to her. I said, I asked for a less lethal clipboard, and she laughed. I said, um, how's, how's your finger? And she goes, it's better. I said, I was, I was really afraid they were going to have to amputate. And she looked at me like, and again, that's my... My snarky sense of humor that some people find it kind of charming, some people get it, and some people look at me like, what is with you? I'm just used to it. You know, after, you know, 58 years on this planet, being this way, it's like, all right. But um, she laughed, so that was good. And then I got to work with her on um, The Longest Yard a couple years later, which was, was really fun to see her again. Lisa or Courtney? Courtney. 
Ah, did she, uh, did you ask her how her hand was? <laughs> no, not that time. <laughs> sometimes I know when to filter and edit, and sometimes, um, yeah, I just think, like, everyone's on the same facetious page I'm on, and, and they're not. Uh, but usually I find out in short order. <laughs> Sounds like something my grandfather would do. <laughs> oh, yeah, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's generational. Maybe it's an old vintage style of interacting with people that is maybe falling out of fashion. I don't know. It depends on how you use it. <laughs> yeah, right? It depends yeah. on your audience. You know, does it land or does it not land? Right. So another recurring role that you did uh, was as the waiter at the Tipton Hotel on The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody. So was that meant to be a one-time character as well? Um, yeah, I think so. I think they weren't sure whether they were going to keep using the restaurant set as, a, as part of their storytelling, as a device. Okay. Um, or not. And uh, when they did keep it, yeah, they, um, uh, they made me the, the go-to recurring Mater D. And originally, I think the character's name was Walter, and they were on set the first time. They go, yeah, we don't like that name. What if we should find a different name? Someone just goes, just use Patrick. They went, yeah. And I, then suddenly I was Patrick. I was like, do I have a choice in this at all? You're, you're using my own name. Uh, it, it felt a little weird, <laughs> but um, it worked out. Yeah, to, ha yeah, to basically be named after, to have the character basically named after you, that's what I had kind of figured. Uh, yeah, that's kind of how it happened, but it was a very casual moment. I was like, yeah, I don't like that name, Walter. What should we call him? I'll call him Patrick. <laughs> That's funny. That's how big decisions are made in Hollywood, sir. Nice. Um, yeah. Were you ever offered to be on The Sweet Life on Deck? No, no. Um, well, you know, I, I wouldn't have fit in that world, and they were expanding new characters and new storylines and everything like that. And, you know, um, I think some of the characters, like the regulars and stuff like that, maybe some of the other recurrents from regulars to Sweet Life um, came on, uh, to Sweet Life on deck. But, uh, no, uh, Patrick, the Mater D, was not one of them. And, you know, that's absolutely fine. That's part of, you know, this business is that there's no guarantees. So even when I am doing a recurring role and they, want, they say, oh, hey, are you free, you know, next month we want you to do another episode, it's always like a surprise birthday gift, you know? It's like nice. they didn't have to, they don't have to bring you back at all. And, uh, and, and when they do, great, fantastic, you know? But I always think you're like, well, they're going to move on. You know, they're going to write different stories. They're going to leave this space. Or, you know, they might find that they need something different in the show. And the role that you do, frankly, just isn't so important that they, they use your role and switch that time and that, you know, that slot out for somebody else right. that fills what they need, you know? Yeah. So it's nothing to take personal. Understandable. Uh, I've been watching a lot of the, uh, uh, honestly, a lot of the shows that I've mentioned, I've been watching a lot of to kind of get ready for this. Uh, Sweet Life on Deck, even though you weren't on that, I have kind of been watching that a lot lately as well. I feel like the real snarkiness kind of came from Mr. Mosby on that one. Oh, I'll bet. Yeah. Yeah. Phil, Phil's great at that. And, you know, it's, um, it's a real gift to be able to play that and remain likable. You know, um, I often do it without them being likable. I often do it without them being really um, powerful, you know, so that nobody's really afraid of them, of, of my more villainous kind of characters. You always feel like you could handle yourself in the room with, with my guys. But it's, still, it's so weird. None of your characters seem villainous. They just seem sarcastic. Yeah, but, you know, I, I guess I should put villainous in quotes, you know. <laughs> um, the... the, the but I've gotten used to playing um, annoyances and abrasive people. Um, uh, and uh, it's, frankly, it's kind of fun, you know, because I know what I'm doing. I'm usually pushing the buttons of the lead or lead characters, you know, and, uh, and that's fun. Speaking of an annoyance and pushing the buttons of the lead characters, uh, another show I, I wanted to talk about was Good Luck Charlie, where you were Teddy's teacher in one episode, who, for some reason... And it was clear to see that he uh, that he couldn't stand um, Teddy, but really loved Charlie. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I, I thought of that character as being one of those people that was just so over it. You don't know what's going on in their home life or whatever, and they just can't take any extra annoying questions or anything. And then, and Teddy was very enthusiastic, you know. And oh yeah, and always. I, I think that was just too much for him. 
mm-hmm. you know? Um, but then that magical baby just kind of, you know, um, you know, kind of short circuited him. Right. It was escapism. It was like, you know, how can you not be touched and moved and, and, and amazed by, you know, this wonderful little creature that is not asking him a bunch of questions. <laughs> writing for that was pretty good especially when they had that heart to heart and she said something and he said something basically like you know everyone's not going to like you in life yeah. you need to get used to that because I think he said it in a way that was still pretty sympathetic you know he was trying mm. to give her an important life lesson mm. and I thought the writing for that was, was pretty smart actually I thought that was a, a pretty good takeaway for you know kids watching to realize that you're not going to have 100% approval ratings, and if you try for that, you're going to you're gonna mess up. Be yourself, let the chips fall where they will, and make adjustments as necessary. I just thought it was a good message. A wise lesson there from Patrick Bristow. Well, from the writers of, um, of uh, Good Luck Charlie. Yeah, but I'm you're... Just, but, I'm just relaying it. Yeah, you're the one saying it. <laughs> I'm the teacher's assistant. Yeah. I can't take I will say that opening scene, like the cold open of Good Luck Charlie, where you were in, uh, where she's uh, saying to Mr. Dingwall, uh, I was expecting an A, and you had responded, ah, yes, A. The first letters in the word annoying and adios. Yeah. What a jerk. <laughs> I, I've had some very sarcastic teachers uh, when I was in high school. Uh, when I was in, can, can I tell you a funny little story? When I was in grade 12, it was the first day of my last year of high school, I, uh, I had my schedule in hand, and it said my first class was food science. And it's funny, I ran into my food science teacher yesterday. Hi, Mr. Boudreau, if you are watching. Hi. And so I, I went into the room, and there was uh, my teacher, and I said, excuse me, am I in the right place for food science? And he's like, nope, sorry. And I was like, all right, see you later. And he's like, just sit down anywhere. <laughs> Right. I almost did. I thought he was being serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, um, you know, sometimes I can like, like clock. Oh my god, this person's not up for this kind of facetiousness. So it just doesn't land with them, and then you know, shift gears immediately because I don't want to make somebody uncomfortable. You know, but um, but yeah, uh, yeah. He sounds like we might be cut from the same cloth. <laughs> One of my one of my favorite teachers from high school, a different guy, but he was always known for his sarcasm. That's what uh, that's what everyone loved him for. And this is in Nova Scotia, right? Canada? Yep. Yep, on the east coast of Canada. Right. I mean, is, is sarcasm is, is there Canadian sarcasm? Every Canadian I've met has been so genuine and easy and politely direct, and you know. I tr- uh, well, I try my best to be like that. So. It seems like it's a national character um, issue of pride or something. We, we took our puppet show, Puppet Up, to, uh, it was called Stumped and Unstrung at the time, to Toronto. Oh, to wow. To the Panasonic Theater a few years back. And um, the audiences were great. They were so smart. The suggestions for the improvs were imaginative and great. Um, and they were down to laugh and everything. But they were not the raucous American or raucous Australian audiences we'd had before. And so I had, in my opening MC, when I told them, I'm going to ask you for suggestions, so just shout them out, I, I wasn't getting them to shout. They didn't want to shout. Without, oh, wow. And people would raise their hand. Oh, wow. So finally, I had to build into my opening MC. I go, you guys, just when I ask you a question, like for a location or a relationship or something for one of our improvs, just shout it out loud and proud like an American would, and that's how we'll get this going. Does that sound like a deal? And then they relaxed and went, oh, okay, great. So we just basically have to be boorish, and, uh, and so for you know a couple hours each night, about you know five hundred people in Toronto got to uh, got to forget their manners. Nice. Have a good time. Maybe sarcasm is just an East Coast thing. Yeah, well, I'm I'm dyed in the wool West Coast man, so I don't know. I I, I think it's uh, I, I I think it's everywhere, but um, but yeah, certainly. Uh, I met with Canada. Canada I, yeah. I just got uh, Canadians to be so delightfully polite, respectful. Um, you know, it, it was it was really stunning. I, I, I've got to say, I was very impressed. Nice. 
So going back to an earlier conversation about uh, Bell and the Bulldogs, as I've said, that was the show that inspired me to want to get into filmmaking, and you did two episodes of that. Yes, I did. And you said that you had a long story about it. Would you like to share? I, for, for the viewers, I know you can't see it, but he's dying laughing, so I have a feeling that I this am, is going to be very oh entertaining. Oh, God. Okay. Um, <laughs> so the one where uh, Bella and the, and the kids all went to um, that western, you know, recreation town. Do you remember that episode? Oh, I, I've seen them all. Okay. And, you know, and they all had to dress in, you know, prairie costumes and everything and learn what life was like in the Old West. And my character, who had been established as the choir teacher before. Right drama teacher, whatever, um, was the one who was going to be taking them there. So he was going to be dressed in Western gear and everything like that. And when they first got to this town, which they had set up outside of the sound station, it made this old Western town, you know, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, wagons and, you know, barrels and storefronts and everything. And about, probably about a hundred extras. Okay. Many of them were very young, you know, either were high school age or looked high school age. And I had what was the equivalent of about a page and a half, uh, two pages maybe, of solid dialogue. Right. And it was just this huge monologue saying like, and I was supposed to be in this character, like I was trying to be a Western guy. And we had rehearsed it like that, and then for some reason it hit me on, on set that day um, that I'm like, I don't think my character would be capable of doing this Western guy. And I had memorized that, you know, page and a half, two pages of dialogue. I had it down like I know, you know, the lyrics to Happy Birthday. Oh, wow. I had it too. Well, you have to. True. Um, and then on set, when I started kind of feeling like, this isn't right. This doesn't feel right. You know, um, I got a little bit panic, a little anxiety, and I was having trouble getting through it. Like, we'd get through the first paragraph, I'd get down off of the, um, the, the wagon, and forget my lines. Oh, jeez. And we had to go back to the beginning. So all those extras, all those city folk had to go right back to their first marks. Some of them were carrying bales of hay or bags of whatever that I'm sure weren't too heavy, but still, you know, we're out in the sun, and I keep messing it up. Wait, you were on location doing that shoot? No, we were outside um, in what would be the parking lot of, oh. of, the, of the studio that we shot it at, and okay. they um, they just dressed the parking lot like the, the old, old West Town. That's very clever. But I think by about the third or fourth take, where I was not getting it, and I was just getting further and further in my head. I mean, I've been doing this for years. To have this kind of, you know, like, just, you know, collapse um, in terms of memory was shocking to me and it was really it was really all about nerves it wasn't like you know i was having a, a stroke or anything it's just something clicked and i just wasn't uh just nothing made sense and so i got caught in my head and th that has not happened since with some other very long dialogue things so it was a one-time thing wow. and the director came out and was just like like patrick what's going on i i said i um bleh. You know, the script came, the supervisor came out, we ran it, ran it, ran it, ran it, and it took about more, two, two more times, and then we got it. But I probably added about 15 to 20 minutes of their schedule that day. I should be admitting this because, you know, producers go, well, we don't want an actor like that. You know, we want you to get it, you know, quickly so that they can deal with the other technical issues they have to do. They don't want to deal with actors forgetting lines. It's um, very annoying to everyone. Um, but, yeah, it just it happened. So that episode is one that I don't think I've, I've actually gone back and watched yet to see how they edited it together and how they made it work. I, I, uh, I, I think you did a fine job. Okay, good, good. Yeah. Um, they probably cobbled a couple takes together or used the final one that, you know, felt like it finally landed. It was just the process of getting to that and those poor extras having to go back and, and do their crosses and their business over and over and over, you know, and I apologize to them on set, you know, um, uh, and they all, you know, at least the ones that smiled, smiled like, eh, we're a big deal, mm. we're getting paid. <laughs> that's a, that's so. a very interesting little behind the scenes story. Yeah, it's not one of the ones I share all the time. <laughs> because it's Espe not especially with millions of people on YouTube. Uh, oh yeah, 
right? <laughs> Luckily, I don't have any lines to remember right now. I'm good. Um, but like I said, you know, I did jobs after that with, you know, equal, um, you know, reams of dialogue and, you know, was fine. But uh, in that moment, wow. I just had, you know, <laughs> there you gone, ding. Yikes, man. Yikes. Mm. So you also were on an episode of a show that I really loved when I was um, when I was a teenager, Crash and Bernstein, where you did a puppeteer who was performing at uh, Jasmine's birthday party, and I remember Crash having a massive crush on one of the puppets, and then just went out. Of, yeah, and well, it, ma it makes a lot of sense because Crash is not shown to be a puppet on the series. Like they don't say that he's a puppet; they just say he's a moving doll, basically. Yeah, yeah, it was. It wasn't. Um, it, it was just in this universe where you know, Crash was Crash. Yeah, yeah, he was you almost. Know, like, he was almost like a human. Um, do you have any funny uh, stories from behind the scenes of that episode? Um, you know, no, no uh, funny stories. But I will say that you know, I was really trying hard to make the puppeteering as good as I could do it, knowing that it wouldn't be as good as a professional. Because I work enough. with puppeteers, professional puppeteers all the time. So I knew that my guy had to not be that good, but he had to be good enough to not give puppeteers a bad name. So I, I knew that puppeteers would watch that episode and go, oh, Bristo, <laughs> you, know, you missed a lip sync there, you know, or mm -hmm. your, your eyes weren't in the right place. But, um, uh, but yeah, I was, uh, I was definitely doing due diligence, practicing my puppetry as much as I could so that it, I, I wouldn't, you know, embarrass my, uh, my, my puppet peeps. <laughs> Some of whom auditioned for it as well. For? Beautiful, but, you know, they... They, they auditioned for the role that you had? Yeah, I was wow. auditioning, uh, often, often auditioning against friends. Nice. So, you, so, you, so for roles like Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, Friends, Belle and the Bulldogs, Good Luck Charlie, uh, do you audition for them often? For some, and then some not. Um, Sweet Life was just offered. The uh, nice. One of the executive producers had been an executive producer showrunner on a show called Grown Ups just a couple years prior, and I recurred on that. So uh, she just thought, oh, you know, let's bring in Patrick. So I, I think that one was an offer. And, you know, a few others have been just flat-out offers. Um, a wedding consultant on um, Last Man Standing. Love that show. Um, all right, and, um, and and a few others, and then sometimes uh, sometimes I audition, so it's a mixture. Nice. Uh, once I'm out of film school, I'd I'd love to write and create my own sitcoms, and I'd love to have you on them occasionally. I don't know my schedule yet, but I'm there. So get to work, please. Uh, for sure, I'll uh, I'll call you in ten years once I'm uh, once I have a sitcom landed. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, maybe if you're ever uh, in town, we'll, uh, uh, I'll uh, have my school have you in a student film. I might not be in school at the time, but I'll recommend you. <laughs> well, I, I, only, if you're, only if you're there. Only if you're there and you're directing. I don't know these other people. I, I can't possibly give my services away to any person in Nova Scotia who wants them. I'd be busy all the time. I'm highly in demand, you know. Uh, but <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> so... Uh, out of all of the uh, TV appearances that you've done, whether or not it's a few episodes, one, is there any one that is a favorite of yours? Like, one that really stands out? Um, you know, I think maybe the, the little guest spot I did on Criminal Minds. Cool. About four years ago. Um, I was playing somebody who, you know, it's kind of a spoiler, but playing somebody who was framed. And uh, the character was described as um, on the spectrum. And so I really wanted to make sure that, you know, I, I, I didn't hit cliches or anything that isn't, you know, um, that isn't truth-based. And so I, I did a lot of research 
and I've got a lot of friends who are um, on the spectrum, and, and a nephew who's actually um, uh, autistic. But what I learned in the research was that there's such a spectrum within the spectrum. Oh, wow. You know, there's so many different levels and, 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 and colors, if you will, um, of people that would be considered on the spectrum. And, and some have one feature and some have another feature. Maybe some have both features, whatever. Um, and so it was very helpful going in. And um, when I played the part, I was, uh, you know, very aware that I wanted to do it as truthfully as, as I was capable of doing Interesting. Um, and I had to cry like about 12 times during the day on that shoot. Jeez, wow. And I was scared that I wouldn't be able to. Um, um, I did, luckily. Um, but the lighting was such, and my head angle was such that you don't even really see it. <laughs> so, you know, that, that whole, you know, actor, you know, nervousness about, oh my God, I've got to cry in this scene. I hope I can do it. I hope I can do it. And then feeling, driving away from it, feeling triumphant, like, yes. I did it 12 times, all, you know, close-ups and, and long shots. I did it every time. And then to see the actual episode and go, oh, well, I didn't realize I was in the dark. <laughs> you know, I didn't realize my head was at a, such an angle you wouldn't see it. So, uh, yeah. It was it was a lovely episode because it was so well-written. And then also, yeah, for me, it was challenging. It wasn't going to the same kind of character that I'd done so many times before. Interesting. So as uh, I'm, I'm getting toward the end of the Q&A, um, you were talking earlier a bit about uh, Puppet Up, uh, which you do with, uh, with Brian Henson. Uh, how, yeah. did, how did Puppet Up come about? Well, um, about 15 years ago, um, Brian wanted some of the regular puppeteers that he hired for different TV and film projects to um, be a little bit more looser and imaginative on set, to bring their own comic voice and their own point of view to the work. He felt like scripted stuff was sounding too scripted. Nice. So um, he asked his wife, Mia Sarah, from Ferris Bueller's Day Off, um, to uh, look around for an improv teacher. She uh, asked a mutual friend, and they said, well, Patrick Bristow. So oh, I, wow. went in for I went in for an interview, and it was her and then with Brian, and we hit it off, and I, I saw what he wanted, and I thought, yeah, I can do this, so we decided to do a six-week, once-a-night improv class with the puppets. Cool. And, and it was interesting, because I had to adapt techniques in improv, which involve eye contact, reading each other's micro-expressions, all that kind of stuff, to, to people that could listen to each other, but couldn't see each other. Right. In the Henson style of, puppet of puppetry, you work at a camera that's over your head. The, the bottom of the camera is at about six foot, six foot two. Right. So the camera only sees the puppet. And then the puppeteer at the same time is looking down at a TV monitor that shows them what the camera sees. So they're never looking at each other, the puppeteers. Right. And puppets don't have real eyes and can't really look at each other. You don't get any benefit from that. So they had to become very, very good ear listeners, very good oral listeners. And they did. They're amazing. Um, I'm so impressed that they are able to improvise and puppeteer to the standards that they do simultaneously. Um, so we did those six weeks, and he said, are you enjoying it? I said, I'm having a great time. And he goes, I think the puppeteers are. Let's continue. So we continued. So by uh, end of the uh, summer, we'd been doing about six months, I said, you know, we... I think the puppeteers would benefit from us doing a little performance. Maybe something here on, on your, your back lot, you know, um, for your employees of the studio at lunchtime or something. Just like a little 45-minute demonstration. And he goes, oh, I'll think about that. And then Brian, of course, you know, um, he doesn't do things by half measures. Next thing I find out, he has booked their soundstage, uh, rented bleacher seats, um, <laughs> you know, extra cameras, all this kind of stuff. And is inviting a guest, of, uh, guest list of 200 people to an evening. And I'm like, whoa, okay. And, um, and it went very well. We got standing ovation. There were people there from the Aspen Comedy Festival. Uh, they liked what we did. Uh, 
even though I believe now, if I look back at it, it probably was rough. There were probably some really great improv moments and probably some moments that did not go so well. But, uh, you know, they were new. And I was new at working with them. So anyway, that led to us going to the Aspen Comedy Festival, which led us going to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival the next cool. summer, which led to us going to Australia for the Melbourne Festival. Um, and then we started doing uh, tours around the U.S., you know, like maybe 10 cities, one night stands, or two weeks in San Francisco, or a week in Chicago. And um, that took us to doing Off-Broadway um, for about three months in uh, 2010. Nice. Yeah. And, um, and we changed the name uh, back to Puppet Up Uncensored. Because for the Broadway show, we changed it to Stuffed and Unstrung, but it doesn't work. Um, yeah, that is so, kind of a bizarre name. No offense. I, no, it doesn't make sense. I, yeah, I was, I was not, I was not a fan. Um, but, uh, but some people that were supposedly marketing geniuses thought it was great, so we gave it a shot. But we ended up having to explain it. You know. Fair. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, pub, uh, stuffed and unstrung sounds like a, a, an upholstery person having a nervous breakdown. You know, it does not. It doesn't does not connote an adult puppet improv show in any way. Interesting. Uh, I'm a huge Muppet fan, so I've kind of watched the uh, Puppet Up appearances. They're, they're really funny, uh, and I know I've, I've talked to quite a few of the puppeteers. I've talked to Victor Yarrett, Alan Trotman, Bill Beretta. Uh, actually, one of the first guests I had on the show was uh, Kevin Carlson. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. I mean, all, all four of them were right there from the beginning. Yeah, nice. So, were you a Muppet fan uh, going into doing Puppet Up with Brian? Like anybody, not particularly. I mean, I didn't have, um, you know, uh, memorabilia and everything like that. Um, but they certainly were a huge part of my, you know, uh, youth and the Muppet Show, the Muppet Movie. Um, and so, yeah, I had a, you know, uh, a history of being <coughs> um, a fan. But it, but going back and teaching with them reawakened it and made it a deeper kind of fandom because I mean I see what dedication these puppeteers have and they're like they're like musical instrument virtuosos nice. it's just their musical instrument is different and their music is movement and so many of them have different styles that I can even sometimes not always sometimes I can see a, a, a puppet performance and go oh that's Leslie Oh, you know what? That's true, um, and and actually be right, because um, they just have their their own approaches and individual kind of puppet voices, for lack of a better uh, phrase. It's cool that you're able to tell who the um, who the who the puppeteers are because uh, because uh, of their styles. Uh, do you know who I mean by Jerry Nelson? Yes. Yeah, the Count, Harry, Floyd, Robin, Gobo. Um, <laughs> One thing I noticed in his puppeteering style, and same with Jim Henson and Carol Spinney, is that often when they're puppeteering, their characters, like, I know that the viewers can't really see it, but I'm puppeteering with my hand, and sometimes I notice that they tend to skip syllables quite a yes. lot. Yep. And that really makes it look a lot more realistic, because if you move the mouth on all the syllables, it just looks like the puppet is moving its mouth too fast. Right. Absolutely. It looks unnatural. That, that, that choice that they make sometimes to not voice, a syllable, um, can make it more natural. Because when you think about it, our mouth isn't opening on every syllable. Sometimes right. it's, it's just our tongue or, you know, um, or making the lips wider or something, but it's not always up and down every syllable. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the lip sync is something that is, uh, you know, it could be an individual style. Um, like, you'll notice Bill Beretta, the top of his puppets hardly ever flap up. Right. Most most of them don't, but he really isolates his thumb as the jaw of the puppet. And right. some people just anatomically can't do that. You know, you're talking about the variation of bone lengths, tensions of tendons, ligaments, whatever, and, you know, nerves and signals. So, but he's just one of those people that really can isolate that thumb beautifully. And then some people from the side do this thing like they're flicking water, so they're, they're inside the puppet, you'd see them kind of doing this. Um, to keep the eyes level so that it's not doing that, which is just the mark of a beginning puppeteer when they flap the head back, 
and the eyes are going up and down. Yeah, it just kind of makes it look like a bobblehead. Yeah, yeah, it, it doesn't it doesn't achieve what Jim Henson discovered and perfected, which was the puppets can have eye contact to the camera lens, and we feel like they're talking right to us. Right. So you keep those eyes right in the lens, and if you can do what Bill Beretta does with his thumb, you don't have to worry about that, that flappiness. Nice. At least this is my my take from the sidelines. Remember, I'm not a puppeteer, but right. um, I have I have lots of semi-informed opinions I'm willing to share. <laughs> Dolores. So, did you see the uh, Happy Time Murders? Yes, I did. I, I, I started it. It was very different than what I was expecting for a, a film with puppets. I will say, I knew it was I knew what I was going to get myself into. But it was yeah. so, it was, and I mean, Brian Henson is a great director. His dad, Jim, is one of my absolute idols as a filmmaker and as a performer. Um, what do you think Jim would think of the Happy Time Murders? I couldn't possibly say. I really couldn't. <laughs> you know, because I, I didn't know him, um, and I think even people that knew him might disagree on what he would say. But I do know that... Um, Jim had a very subversive, naughty sense of humor that he landed in children's programming and stuff with Sesame Street. But, you know, his his real artistic voice and his real attraction was to things that were a little bit uh, darker and more subversive. I think The Muppet Show goes a little that direction. His early commercials have all that violence in them. And oh, the original yeah. title for The Muppet Show when he pitched it was sex and violence. Mm. That actually concerned my mom. <laughs> I'll bet. Yeah. Um, but, you know, puppets can get away with things that, you know, human performers can't. Right. And he loved dark humor. He loved dark humor, you know, that kind of oh, twisted yeah. stuff. Um, so when we first started doing um, our puppet improv performances, there were a fair amount of people in the press that were very critical, saying, oh, Miss Piggy and Kermit would be you know, just shocked at this. And Jim Henson must be rolling in his grave. But his children didn't seem to think so. And right. then Jane Henson, when she finally saw the show, she loved it. That's good. You know, and she was probably a little dubious, I think, when she first came, because she'd heard, like, oh, they're doing, like, you know, R-rated and sometimes maybe even X-rated, you know, moments in these improvs. Um... But she uh, became a big fan of the show and had ideas for it. And oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it was really lovely that, you know, she lived to, to see it, you know, get out there, find an audience, be accepted, see the brouhaha just kind of fade away. And, you know, you have to remember that Jim and Jane were of that kind of beatnik generation. Right. Just before rock and roll. But definitely not, you know, not the World War II generation. These were people that were already, like, experimental and avant-garde and trying to find new, fresh ways to do things. Oh, yeah. Jim was absolutely 100% uh, experimental. Uh, there was a short film I saw from Sesame Street in its early years where he... Uh, are you familiar with a puppet character that he did called Limbo or Face? Um, I know about Limbo's being the, his, his background ones that he liked that were kind of just abstract and nothing. Yeah. But I don't... And, and then Face... Uh, oh, wait a minute. Is it the one where they're, they're strings, basically? Yeah, yeah. He called that character oh, Limbo yeah. or Mr. Nobody. Right, 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 yeah. right. Yes, and it's, and it's operated with a series of strings that are opening the eyes and the mouth apertures. And then it's against... Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, he had that puppet, or w whatever the heck it was, it was certainly an interesting kind of puppet. He had it on Sesame Street in its early years. This was in like 1970, so it was the early days of computer uh, graphic animation, and he had that character in these little uh, films that were about counting, and they were made using Scanimate, which was an old uh, computer analog uh, system. So th that goes to show his experimental ways, for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. He was not... You know, he wasn't just going to, you know, stick on one puppet and have an entire career, you know, just with that technology and just with that approach. Yeah. And if anyone is interested in seeing that kind of experimental thing, I'm going to put a link to 
that particular uh, clip from Sesame Street in the corner of the video uh, if you'd like to see it. So feel free to click the corner oh. of the video if you want. Excellent. So that's, uh, that basically wraps it up uh, for me. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Um, no, just, you know, it's been a delight talking to you, um, you know, Thank especially you. since you're, you're so informed about, you know, all things Henson, and then, of course, you did your, your homework about my, uh, my career as it, as it is, um, and, uh, you know, I think you're a very, very skilled interviewer, and it was just really lovely talking to you. Thank you very much. It's been really lovely talking to you as well and hearing all the funny stories that you have. And, you know, uh, my best to uh, your food sciences teacher, if he's watching. <laughs> all right? Yeah. Uh, and so, all, your, all your viewers. Thank you very much. Uh, and to the viewers, I've got more Nostalgia Talk coming up. I am shooting one on Friday. I won't say who it's with. And I am filming one on Sunday. And that one, in particular, is going to be very exciting, I think. And again, I won't give away who that is, who that is with. Uh, but uh, keep checking back. Peace. All right. Thank you so much, James. Hope this works out for you. Thank you very much.